Okay, we're trying again. Um, Twitch keeps deciding to... Or OBS. I don't know which, and I don't know why. But it keeps deciding to stop the stream randomly. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to have to play, pay really close attention. Uh, it happened today, just now, and it happened on Friday when I originally read this part of the chapter. Um, and it destroyed the video, so I'll just have to be careful. I don't know why it's doing this. I'll troubleshoot it after this. But anyway, we're at the end of chapter two and the beginning of chapter three. Um, that will leave us with a little fewer, a little less than 100 pages out of 400 page book remaining. So yeah, chapters three and four are a lot shorter than the first two. Um, all right, I've got a mocha and some water and I'm ready to party. I'm just really hoping that I don't get shut down again randomly by OBS. Um, all right, give me like 30 seconds and then we'll get down to it. Okay, let's try again. Um, really hope it doesn't cut out on me again. That was frustrating. All right, here we go. <laughs> but I don't like rings. It isn't a question of what you like, Jernal Gurgay. When you go to Heyman's estate, you'll be outside this module. I might not always be close by. And anyway, I'm not a specialist in toxicology. You'll be eating their food and drinking their drink, and you have some very clever chemists and exobiologists on hand. But if you wear one of these on each hand, index finger preferably, you should be safe from poisoning. If you feel a single jab, it means a non-lethal drug, such as a hallucinogen. Three jabs mean somebody's out to waste you. What do two jabs mean? I don't know. A malfunction, probably. Now, will you put them on? They really don't suit me. Would a shroud? They feel funny. Never mind if they work. How about a magic amulet to ward off bullets? Are you serious? I mean, if you are, there is a passive sensor impact shield jewelry set on board, but they'd probably use crews. Gurgay waved one ringed hand. Oh, never mind. He sat down again, turning on a military execution channel. The drone found it difficult to talk to the man. He wouldn't listen. It attempted to explain that despite all the horrors he had seen in the city and on the screen, there was still nothing the culture could do that wouldn't do more harm than good. It tried to tell him that the contact section, the whole culture, in fact, was like him, dressed in his cloak and standing unable to help the man lying injured in the street. That they had to stick to their disguise and wait until the moment was right, but either its arguments weren't getting through to him, or that wasn't what the man was thinking about, because he made no response and wouldn't enter into a discussion about it. Flair Imzaho didn't go out much during the days between the end of the game with Bromoia and the journey to Heyman's estate. Instead, it stayed in with the man, worrying. Mr. Gurgay, I am pleased to meet you. The old apex put out his hand. Gurgay grasped it. I hope you had a pleasant flight here, yes? We did, thank you, Gurgay said. They stood on the roof of a low building, set in luxuriant green vegetation and looking out over the calm waters of the inland sea. The house was almost submerged in the burgeoning greenery, only the roof was fully clear of the swaying treetops. Nearby were paddocks full of riding animals, and from the various levels of the house, long, sweeping gantries, elegant and slim, soared out through the crowding trunks above the shady forest floor, giving access to the golden beaches and the pavilions and summer houses of the estate. In the sky, huge, sunlit clouds piled sparkling over the distant mainland. You say we, Heyman said, as they walked across the roof and liveried males took Gurgay's baggage from the aircraft. 
And the drone, Flare Imzaho and I, Gurgay said, nodding to the bulky, buzzing machine at his shoulder. Ah, yes, the old apex laughed, bald head reflecting the binary light. The machine, some people thought, let you play so well. They descended to a long balcony set with many tables, where Heyman introduced Gurgay and the drone to various people, mostly apices, plus a few elegant females. There was only one person Gurgay already knew. The smiling Loshav Olos put down a drink and rose from his table, taking Gurgay's hand. Mr. Gurgay, how good to see you again. Your luck held out and your skill increased. A formidable achievement. Congratulations once again. The Apex's gaze flicked momentarily to Gourguet's ringed fingers. Thank you. It was at a price I'd have willingly foregone. Indeed. You never cease to surprise us, Mr. Gourguet. I'm sure I shall, eventually. But you are too modest. Olos smiled and sat down. Oh, hang on. Gotta close the door for my cat. Or after my cat, rather. <clears throat> Gourguet declined the offer to visit his rooms and freshen up. He felt perfectly fresh already. He sat at a table with Heyman, some other directors of Kansev College, and a few court officials. Chilled wines and spiced snacks were served. Blair Imzaho settled relatively quietly on the floor by Gourguet's feet. Gourguet's new rings appeared to be happy there was nothing more damaging than alcohol in the fair being served. The conversation mostly avoided Gurge's last game. Everyone pronounced his name correctly. The college directors asked him about his unique game style. Gurge answered as best he could. The court officials inquired politely about his home world, and he told them some nonsense about living on a planet. They asked him about Flair Imzaho, and Gurge expected the machine to answer, but it didn't, so he told them the truth. The machine was a person by the culture's definition. It could do as it liked, and it did not belong to him. One tall and strikingly beautiful female, a companion of Lo Shav Olos, who'd come over to join their table, asked the drone if its master played logically or not. Flair Imzaho replied, with a trace of weariness Gurge suspected only he could detect, that Gurge was not its master, and that it supposed he thought more logically than it did when he was playing games, but that anyway, it knew very little about Azad. They all found this most amusing. Heyman stood then and suggested that his stomach, with over two and a half centuries of experience behind it, could tell it was approaching time for dinner better than any servant's clock. People laughed and gradually began to depart the long balcony. Heyman escorted Gourguet to his room personally and told him a servant would let him know when the meal was to be served. I wish I knew why they invited you here, Flair Imzaho said, quickly unpacking Gurgay's few cases while the man looked out the window at the still trees and the calm sea. Perhaps they want to recruit me for the Empire. What do you think, Drone? Would I make a good general? Oh, don't be facetious, General Gurgay. The drone switched to Marine. And not to forget, random domran, here bugged are we, nonsense wansons. Gurgay looked concerned and said in Aachic, Heavens, drone, are you developing a speech impediment? Gurgay! The drone hissed, setting out some clothes the Empire deemed suitable to be worn when eating. Gurgay turned away, smiling. Maybe they just want to kill me. I wonder if they want any help. Gurgay laughed and came over to the bed where the drone had laid out the formal clothing. Oh, it'll be all right. So you say, but we haven't even got the protection of the module here, let alone anything else. But let's not worry about it. Gourguet picked up a couple of the robe pieces and tried them against his body, holding them under his chin and looking down. I'm not worried anyway, he said. The drone shouted at him in exasperation. Oh, Jarnau Gourguet, how many times do I have to tell you you cannot wear red and green together like that? You like music, Mr. Gurgay? Heyman asked, leaning over to the man. Gurgay nodded. Well, a little does no harm. Heyman sat back, 
apparently satisfied with this answer. They had climbed to the broad roof garden after dinner, which had been a long, complicated, and very filling affair, during which naked females had danced in the center of the room, and, if Gurge's rings were to be believed, nobody had tried to interfere with his food. It was dusk now, and the party was outside in the warm evening air, listening to the wailing music produced by a group of apex musicians. Slender gantries led from the garden into the tall, graceful trees. Gurge sat at a small table with Haman and Olos. Flair Imzaho sat near his feet. Lamps shone in the trees around them. The roof garden was its own island of light in the night, surrounded by the cries of birds and animals, calling out as though in answer to the music. I wonder, Mr. Gurge, Haman said, sipping his drink and lighting a long, small, bold pipe. Did you find any of our dancing girls attractive? He pulled on the long-stemmed pipe, with the, I'm sorry, he pulled on the long-stemmed pipe then, with the smoke wreathing around his bald head, went on. I only ask because one of them, she with the silver streak in her hair, remember, did express rather an interest in you. I'm sorry, I hope I'm not shocking you, Mr. Gurge, am I? Not in the least. Well, I just wanted to say you're among friends here, yes? You've more than proved yourself in the game, and this is a very private place, outside the gaze of the press and the common people, who of course have to depend on certain hard and fast rules, whereas we do not, are not here. You catch my drift. You may relax in confidence. I'm most grateful. I shall certainly try to relax, but I was told before I came here that I would be found ugly, even disfigured by your people. Your kindness overwhelms me, but I would prefer not to inflict myself on somebody who might not be available through choice alone. Mm, too modest again, Janao Gurge, Olos smiled. Haman nodded, puffing on his pipe. You know, Mr. Gurge, I have heard that in your culture you have no laws. I'm sure this is an exaggeration, but there must be a grain of truth in the assertion. And I would guess you must find the number and strictness of our laws uh, to be a great difference between your society and ours. Here we have many rules and try to live according to the laws of God, game, and empire. But one of the advantages of having laws is the pleasure one may take in breaking them. We here are not children, Mr. Gurge. Haman waved the pipe stem round the tables of people. Rules and laws exist only because we take pleasure in doing what they forbid. But as long as most of the people obey such proscriptions most of the time, they've done their job. Blind obedience would imply we are... Ha! Heyman chuckled and pointed at the drone with the pipe. No more than robots. Flair Imzaho buzzed a little louder, but only momentarily. There was silence. Gurge drank from his glass. Olos and Haman exchanged looks. Janao Gurge, Olos said at last, rolling his glass round in his hands. Let's be frank. You're an embarrassment to us. You've done very much better than we expected. We did not think we could be so easily fooled, but somehow you did it. I congratulate you on whatever ruse it was you used, whether it centered on your drug glands, your machine there, or simply many more years playing a Zod than you admitted to. You have bettered us, and we're impressed. I am only sorry that innocent people, such as those bystanders who were shot instead of you, and low prenest Bermoia, had to be hurt. As you have no doubt guessed, we would like you to go no further in the game. Now, the Imperial Office has nothing to do with the Games Bureau, so there is little we can do directly. We do have a suggestion, though. What's that? Gurge sipped his drink. As I've been saying, Haman pointed the stem of the pipe at Gurge, we have many laws. We therefore have many crimes. Some of these are of a sexual nature, yes? Gurge looked down at his drink. I need hardly point out, Haman continued, that the physiology of our race makes us unusual. One might almost say gifted in that respect. Also, in our society, it is possible to control people. It is possible to make somebody, or even several people, do things they might not want to do. We can offer you here the sort of experience which, by your own admission, would be impossible on your own world. 
The old apex leaned closer, dropping his voice. Can you imagine what it might be like to have several females and males, even apices if you like, who will do your every bidding? Heyman knocked his pipe out on the table leg. The ash drifted over the humming bulk of Flair Imzaho. The rector of Kensev College smiled in a conspiratorial way and sat back, repacking his pipe from a small pouch. Olos leaned forward. This whole island is yours for as long as you want it, Jernal Gurgay. You may have as many people of whatever sexual mix as you like for as long as you desire. But I pull out of the game. You retire, yes, Olos said. Heyman nodded. There are precedents. Mm, the whole island. Gurgay made a show of looking around the gently lit roof garden. A troop of dancers appeared. Their lithe, skimpily dressed men, women, and apices made their way up some steps to a small stage raised behind the musicians. Everything, Olo said. The island, the house, servants, dancers. Everything and every one. Gurgay nodded, but didn't say anything. Heyman relit his pipe. Even the band, he said, coughing. He waved at the musicians. What do you think of their instruments, Mr. Gurgay? Do they not sound sweet? Very pleasant. Gurgay drank a little, watching the dancers arrange themselves on stage. <clears throat> Even there, though, Heyman said, you are missing something. You see, we gain a great deal of pleasure from knowing at what cost this music is brought. I'm sorry. We gain a great deal of pleasure from knowing at what cost this music is bought. You see the stringed instrument, the one on the left with the eight strings? Bourguet nodded. Heyman said, I can tell you that each of those steel strings has strangled a man. You see that white pipe at the back, played by the male? The pipe shaped like a bone. Heyman laughed. A female's femur, removed without anesthetic. Naturally, Gurgay said, and took a few sweet-tasting nuts from a bowl on the table. Do they come in matched pairs, or are there a lot of one-legged lady music critics? Heyman smiled. You see, he said to Olos, he does appreciate the old apex gestured back at the band, behind whom the dancers were now arranged, ready to start their performance. The drums are made from human skin. You can see why each set is called a family. The horizontal percussion instrument is constructed from finger bones, and, well, there are other instruments. But can you understand now why that music sounds so precious to those of us who know what has gone into the making of it? Oh, yes, Gurgay said. The dancers began. Fluid. Practiced. They impressed almost immediately. Some must have worn AG units, floating through the air like huge, diaphanously slow birds. Good, Heyman nodded. You see, Gurgay, one can be either side in the Empire, one can be the player, or one can be played upon. Heyman smiled at what was a play on words in Aochic, and to some extent in Marain, too. Gurgay watched the dancers for a moment. Without looking away from them, he said, I'll play, Rector, on Ikronodol. He tapped one ring on the rim of his glass in time to the music. Heyman sighed. Well, I have to tell you, Jernal Gurgay, that we are worried. He pulled on the pipe again, studied the glowing bowl. Worried about the effect you're getting any further in the game would have on the morale of our people. So many of them are just simple folk. It is our duty to shield them from the harsh realities sometimes. And what harsher reality can there be than the realization that most of one's kin are gullible, cruel, and foolish? They would not understand that a stranger, an alien, can come here and do so well at the holy game. We here... Those of us in the court and the colleges might not be so concerned, but we have to keep the ordinary, decent, I would even go so far as to say innocent people in mind, Mr. Gurgay, and what we have to do in that respect, what we sometimes have to take responsibility for, does not always make us happy. But we know our duty, and we will do it, 
for them and for our emperor. Haman leaned forward. We don't intend to kill you, Mr. Gurgay, though I'm told there are factions in the court who'd like nothing better, and they say people in the security service is easily capable of doing so. No, nothing so gross, but... The old apex sucked on the thin pipe, producing a gentle papping noise. Gurgay waited. Payment pointed the stem at him again. I have to tell you, Gurgay, that no matter how you do in the first game on a Chronodal, it will be announced that you have been defeated. We have unequivocal control of the communications and news services on the Fire Planet. And as far as the press and the public will be concerned, you will be knocked out in the first round there. We will do whatever has to be done to make it appear that this is exactly what has in fact happened. You are free to tell people I've told you this, and free to claim whatever you want after the event. You will be ridiculed, though, and what I have described will happen anyway. The truth has already been decided. Alos's turn. So you see, Gurgay, you may go to a Kronodol, but to certain defeat. Absolutely certain defeat. Go as a high-class tourist if you want, or stay here and enjoy yourself as our guest, but there is no longer any point in playing. Hmm, Gurgay said. The dancers were slowly losing their clothes as they stripped each other. Some of them, still dancing, were at the same time contriving to stroke and touch each other in an exaggeratedly sexual way. Gurgay nodded. I'll think about it. Then he smiled at the two apices. I'd like to see your fire planet all the same. He drank from the cool glass and watched the slow build-up of erotic choreography behind the musicians. Other than that, though, I can't imagine I'll be try- uh, bleh. <laughs> Other than that, though, I can't imagine I'll be trying too terribly hard. Payment was studying his pipe. Olos looked very serious. Gurgay held out his hands in a gesture of resigned helplessness. What more can I say? Would you be prepared to cooperate, though? Olos said. Gorgay looked inquisitive. Olos reached slowly over and tapped the rim of Gorgay's glass. Something that would ring true, he said softly. Gorgay watched the two apices exchange glances. He waited for them to make their play. Documentary evidence. Heyman said after a moment, talking to his pipe. A film of you looking worried over a bad board position. Maybe even an interview. We could arrange these things without your cooperation, naturally. But it would be easier, less fraught for all concerned with your aid. The old apex sucked on his pipe. Olo drank, glancing at the romantic antics of the dance troupe. Gurgay looked surprised. You mean lie? Participate in the construction of your false reality. Our real reality, Gurgay, Olos said quietly. The official version, the one that will have documentary evidence to support it, the one that will be believed. Gurgay grinned broadly. I'd be delighted to help. Of course, I shall regard it as a challenge to produce a definitively abject interview for popular consumption. I'll even help you work out positions so awful even I can't get out of them. He raised his glass to them. After all, it's the game that matters, is it not? Heyman snorted. His shoulders shook. He sucked on the pipe again and through a veil of smoke said, No true game player could say more. He patted Gurgay on the shoulder. Mr. Gurgay, even if you choose not to avail yourself of the facilities my house has to offer, I hope you'll stay with us for a while. I should enjoy talking with you. Will you stay? Why not? Gurgay said, and he and Heyman raised their glasses to each other. Olos sat back, laughing silently. Together, the three turned to watch the dancers who had now formed a copulatorily complicated pattern of bodies in a carnal jigsaw, still keeping, Gurgay was impressed to note, to the beat of the music. He stayed at the house for the next fifteen days, 
He talked guardedly with the old rector during that time. He still felt they didn't really know each other when he left, but perhaps they knew a little more of each other's societies. Heyman obviously found it hard to believe the culture really did do without money. <laughs> but what if I do want something unreasonable? What? My own planet? Heyman wheezed with laughter. How can you own a planet? Gorgay shook his head. But supposing I wanted one? I suppose if you found an unoccupied one, you could land without anybody becoming annoyed. Perhaps that would work, but how would you stop other people landing there too? Could I not buy a fleet of warships? All our ships are sentient. You could certainly try telling a ship what to do, but I don't think you'd get very far. Your ships think they're sentient, Heyman chuckled. A common delusion shared by some of our human citizens. Heyman found the culture's sexual mores even more fascinating. He was at once delighted and outraged that the culture regarded homosexuality, incest, sex changing, hermaphrodisy, and sexual characteristic alteration as just something else people did, like going on a cruise or changing their hairstyle. Heyman thought this must take all the fun out of things. Didn't the culture forbid anything? Gurguet attempted to explain that there were no written laws, but almost no crime anyway. There was the occasional crime of passion, as Heyman chose to call it, but little else. It was difficult to get away with anything anyway, when everybody had a terminal, but there were very few motives left, too. But if somebody kills somebody else... Gurguet shrugged. They're slap-droned. Ah, this sounds more like it. What does this drone do? Follows you around and makes sure you never do it again. Is that all? What more do you want? Social death, Heyman. You won't get invited to too many parties. Ah, but in your culture, can't you gatecrash? I suppose so, Gurge conceded, but nobody would talk to you. As for what Heyman told Gurge about the Empire, it only made him appreciate what Shohobaham Zaw had said, that it was a gem, however vicious and indiscriminate its cutting edges might be. It was not so difficult to understand the warped view the Azadians had of what they called, quote, human nature, the phrase they used whenever they had to justify something inhuman and unnatural, when they were surrounded and subsumed by the self-created monster that was the Empire of Azad, and which displayed such a fierce instinct, Gurge could think of no other word, for self-preservation. The Empire wanted to survive. It was like an animal, a massive, powerful body that could only let certain cells or viruses survive within it, and as a matter of course, killed off any and all others, automatically and unthinkingly. Heyman himself used this analogy when he compared revolutionaries to cancer. Gurge tried to say that single cells were single cells, while a conscious collection of hundreds of billions of them, or a conscious device, made from arrays of pico circuitry, for that matter, was simply incomparable. But Heyman refused to listen. It was Gurge, not he, who'd missed the point. The rest of the time, Gurge spent walking in the forest, or swimming in the warm, slack sea. The slow rhythm of Heyman's house was built around meals, and Gurge learned to take great care in dressing for these, eating them, talking to the guests, old and new, as people came and went, and relaxing afterward, bloated and spacey, continuing to talk, and watching the deliberate entertainment of usually erotic dances, and the involuntary cabaret of changing sexual alliances among the guests, dancers, servants, and house staff. Gurge was enticed many times, but never tempted. He found the Azadian females more and more attractive all the time, and not just physically, but used his genofixed glands in a negative, even contrary way, to stay carnally sober in the midst of the subtly exhibited orgy around him. A pleasant enough few days. The rings did not jab him, and nobody shot at him. He and Flair Imzaho got back safely to the module on the roof of the Grand Hotel a couple of days before the Imperial fleet was due to depart for a Cronadal. Gorge and the drone would have preferred to take the module, which was perfectly capable of making the crossing by itself, but contact had forbidden that. The effect on the Admiralty of discovering that something no larger than a lifeboat could outstrip their battlecruisers was not something to be contemplated. 
and the Empire had refused permission for the alien machine to be conveyed inside an Imperial craft, so Gourguet would have to make the journey with the fleet like everybody else. You think you've got problems, Flair Imzaho said bitterly. They'll be watching us all the time, on the liner during the crossing, and then once we're in the castle, that means I've got to stay inside this ridiculous disguise all day and all night until the games are over. Why couldn't you have lost in the first round like you were supposed to? We could have told them where to insert their fire planet and been back on a GSV by now. Ugh, shut up, machine. As it turned out, they needn't have returned to the module. There was nothing more to take or pack. He stood in the small lounge, fiddling with the orbital bracelet on his wrist, and realizing he was looking forward to the coming games on a Chronodol more than he had any of the others. The pressure would be off. He wouldn't have to face the opprobrium of the press and the Empire's ghastly general public. He could cooperate with the Empire to produce a convincing piece of fake news, and the likelihood of more physical option bets had thereby been reduced almost to zero. He was going to enjoy himself. Fleur Imzaho was glad to see the man was getting over the effects of seeing behind the screen the Empire showed its guests. He was much as he'd been before, and the days at Heyman's estate seemed to have relaxed him. It could see a small change in him, though, something it could not quite pin down, but which it knew was there. They did not see Shahobahamzah again. He'd left on a tour, quote, upcountry, wherever that was. He sent his regards and a message in Marain to the effect that if Gurgay could lay his mitts on some fresh griff. Before they left, Gurgay asked the module about the girl he'd met at the Grand Ball months earlier. He couldn't remember her name, but if the module could provide a list of the females who'd survived the first round, he was sure he'd recognize hers. The module got confused, but Flair Imzaho told them both to forget it. No women had made it to the second round. Peckwell came with them to the shuttle port. His arm was fully healed. Gurgay and Flair Imzaho bade farewell to the module and climbed into the sky for a rendezvous with the distant limiting factor. They said goodbye to Peckwell too. He took Gurgay's hand in both of his, and then the man and the drone boarded the shuttle. Gurgay watched Groznicek as it fell away beneath them. The city tilted as he was thrown back into his seat. The whole view swung and juddered as the shuttlecraft powered into the hazy skies. Gradually, all the patterns and the shapes came out, revealed for a while before the increasing distance, the city's own vapors, dust, and grime, and the altering angle of their climb took it all away. For all the jumble, it looked momentarily peaceful and ordered in its parts. The distance made its individual, local confusions and dislocations disappear, and from a certain height, where little detail ever dallied and almost everything just passed through, it looked exactly like a great mindless, spreading organism. <clears throat> Alright, this is the end of chapter 2. Um, I have enough time to read um, the start of chapter 3, so I think we'll do that. Let me just drink some water. Oh man lost my spot. There we go. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Chapter 3. Machina ex Machina. So far, so average. Our game players lucked out again. I guess you can see he's a changed man, though. These humans. I'm going to be consistent, however. I haven't told you who I am so far, and I'm not going to tell you now, either. Maybe later. Maybe. Does identity matter, anyway? I have my doubts. We are what we do, not what we think. Only the interactions count. There is no problem with free will here. That's not incompatible with believing your actions define you. And what is free will, anyway? Chance. The random factor. If one is not ultimately predictable, then of course, that's all it can be. I get so frustrated with people who can't see this. Even a human should be able to understand it's obvious. The result is what matters, not how it's achieved, unless, of course, the process of achieving is itself a series of results. 
What difference does it make whether a mind's made up of enormous, squidgy animal cells working at the speed of sound and air, or from a glittering nanofoam of reflectors and patterns of holographic coherence at light speed? And let's not even think about a mind, mind. Each is a machine, each is an organism, each fulfills the same task, just matter, switching energy of one sort or another, switches, memory, the random element that is chance and that is called choice, common denominators all. I say again, you is what you done. Dynamic misbehaviorism, that's my creed. Gurge, well, his switches are working funny. He's thinking differently, acting uncharacteristically. He is a different person. He's seen the worst that meat grinder of a city could provide, and he just took it personally and took his revenge. Now he's spaceborn again, head crammed full of Azad rules, his brain adapted and adapting to the swirling, switching patterns of that seductive, encompassing, feral set of rules and possibilities, and being carted through space toward the Empire's most creakily symbolic shrine, Ekronadol, the place of the standing wave of flame, the fire planet. But will our hero prevail? Can he possibly prevail? And what would constitute winning anyway? How much has the man still got to learn? What will he make of such knowledge? And more to the point, what will it make of him? Wait and see. It'll work itself out in time. Take it from there, maestro. Ekronadol was twenty light years from Eal. Halfway there, the Imperial fleet left the region of dust that lay between Eal's system and the direction of the main galaxy, and so that vast armed spiral was spread over half the sky like a million jewels caught in a whirlpool. Gurgay was impatient to get to the fire planet. The journey seemed to take forever, and the liner he was making it on was hopelessly cramped. He spent most of the time in his cabin. The bureaucrats, Imperial officials, and other game players on the ship regarded him with undisguised dislike. And apart from a couple of shuttle trips over to the battlecruiser Invincible, the Imperial flagship, for receptions, Gurgay did not socialize. The crossing was made without incident, and after twelve days they arrived over Ekronadol, a planet orbiting a yellow dwarf in a fairly ordinary system and itself a human habitable world, with only one peculiarity. It was not unusual to find distinct equatorial bulges on once fast-spinning planets, and Ekronadol's was comparatively slight, though sufficient to produce a single, unbroken continental ribbon of land lying roughly between the planet's tropics, the rest of the globe lying beneath two great oceans, ice-capped at the poles. What was unique in the experience of the culture, as well as the Empire, was to discover a wave of fire forever moving round the planet on the continental landmass. Taking about half a standard year to complete its circumnavigation, the fire swept over the land, its fringes brushing the shores of the two oceans, its wave front a near straight line, its flames consuming the growth of the plants which had flourished in the ashes of the previous blaze. The whole land-based ecosystem had evolved around this never-ending conflagration. Some plants could only sprout from beneath the still warm cinders, their seeds jolted into development by the passing heat. Other plants blossomed just before the fire arrived, bursting into rapid growth just before the flames found them, and using the firefront's thermals to transport their seeds into the upper atmosphere to fall back again somewhere onto the ash. The land animals of Ekronadol fell into three categories. Some kept constantly on the move, maintaining the same steady walking pace as the fire. Some swam round its oceanic boundaries, while other species burrowed into the ground hidden caves, or survived through a variety of mechanisms in lakes or rivers. Birds circled the world like a jet stream of feathers. The blaze remained little more than a large, continuous bushfire for eleven revolutions. On the twelfth, it changed. The cinderbud was a tall, skinny plant which grew quickly once its seeds had germinated. It developed an armored base and shot up to a height of ten meters or more in the two hundred days it had before the flames came round again. When the fire did arrive, the cinder bud didn't burn. It closed its leafy head until the blaze had passed, then kept on growing in the ashes. After eleven of those great months, eleven baptisms in the flames, the cinder buds were great trees, anything up to seventy meters in height. Their own chemistry then produced first the oxygen season, and then the incandescence. And in that sudden cycle, the fire didn't walk, it sprinted. It was no longer a wide but low and even mild bushfire, it was an inferno. 
Lakes disappeared, rivers dried, rocks crumbled in its baking heat. Every animal that had evolved its own way of dodging or keeping pace with the fires of the great months had had to find another method of surviving. Running fast enough to build up a sufficient lead on the incandescence to still keep ahead of it, swimming far out into the ocean or to the few mostly small islands off the coasts, or hibernating deep in the great cave systems or on the beds of deep rivers, lakes, and fjords. Plants, too, switched to new survival mechanisms, rooting deeper, growing thicker seed cases, or equipping their thermal seeds for higher, longer flight and the baked ground they would encounter on landing. For a great month thereafter, the planet, its atmosphere choked with so uh, sorry, <laughs> its atmosphere choked with smoke, soot, and ash, wavered on the edge of catastrophe as smoke clouds blocked out the sun and the temperature plummeted. Then, slowly, while the diminished small fire continued on its way, the atmosphere cleared, the animals started to breed again, the plants grew once more, and the little cinder buds started sprouting through the ashes from the old root complexes. The Empire's castles on a chronodol, extravagantly sprinklered and doused, had been built to survive whatever terrible heat and screaming winds the planet's bizarre ecology could provide, and it was in the greatest of those fortresses, Castle Claff, that for the last 300 standard years the final games of Azad had been played, timed to coincide, whenever possible, with the incandescence. Hmm. Alright, I'm on a bit of a time crunch, so this is a good place for us to stop. Um, yeah, so let's see how many pages we got left before we begin some more adventures with Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, it's like about 90-ish pages, um, which we should probably get through in like three to four videos, I imagine, depending. I don't know. We'll see. Um, pardon me. I have to stretch. <laughs> All right. I'm really hoping Twitch did not eat up any of the video this time. I don't want to read the section for a third time. It's a good book, but... I can only read the same section so many times. <laughs> uh, if you're listening in right now, I really appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out. It's always a good time. And, um, you know, it's just nice to have folks listen in. Uh, if you're listening on YouTube, thank you for that as well. And please feel free to send any suggestions or feedback to my Gmail. It's the same as my YouTube. Uh, Gmail.com, obviously. <laughs> and thanks again to Eindolmadir for the use of all his tunes. Uh, if you're not listening to him while you read on your own yet, I highly recommend it. Um, all right, folks, I will see you next time and have a great week, weekend, whenever you're listening. Take it easy.